So I think first up, um, you know, what we're trying to get across today is that brain nutrition needs to be prioritized to help us with our mental health resiliency. And it's so important right now. And as we're meeting with different um, stakeholders, one of the questions that I'm getting quite often is, why now? What is the strength of science on seafood nutrition, omega-3s for brain health? And um, you know, I, we see articles, we see books, but I think we've seen for so long seafood and nutrition has been focused on heart health. So why brain health at this time? And, and uh, Dr. Brenna, would you like to take that? And we'll go r around to each of you. Sure. Um, seafood is still good for your heart, hasn't stopped being good for your heart. <laughs> the why now emphasis on brain would seem to be uh, the recognition, widespread recognition of this mental resiliency issue that was exposed during the pandemic. Um, I listen a little bit to the psychiatrists and other mental health professionals who just seem to say they're overwhelmed over all this. And uh, it's not that we haven't known about the brain uh, connection to seafood. Again, we've been talking about this, and you've seen it in mine and in, in the other presentations this morning, uh, that um, We've been thinking about this for many decades, but uh, it just seems like the, the, the pandemic brought it out in that we're, uh, we're, we're, we're seeing widespread recognition of, uh, of a, real, a real issue. Thank you. Dr. Hiblin. The question is, why now? And I recently saw a slide presentation where someone put a quote from Barbara McClintock, the Nobel Prize winner, who said that the ideas are always there, the information is there, you, you need an opening and you need a context. And the pandemic was like pouring gasoline on all of the simmering issues of inflamed brains and, and mental health problems uh, that simply exploded everything. Um, the amount of overwhelm to the mental health services in California was such that uh, it Kaiser Permanente, all the mental health providers went on strike mm. because they were so overwhelmed and had, and had no uh, capacity. Now, make no mistake about this. Mental health disorders are lethal. People die of suicide, they die of misery, they kill other people, they, they beat up their kids and their wives, and this is not what human society should be in, in, the, in, the, in the 2000s, in the 2020s. This is my... my perhaps favorite and most poignant analogy is to say, how is it that we, um, that we, we name junk foods? Why does that symbol and that universal acknowledgement exist? It's because everyone communally has the same reaction of being addicted to a food that makes them feel like junk. So why now? because we're finally realizing that the end outcome of the economic provision of food shouldn't be profit. The end outcome should be asked, how does this change the most fundamental tool of humanity, the brain? And we're finally getting it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hibbelin. Dr. Ramsey? Um, the question is, um, you know, the strength of science on seafood for brain health, and, and now, you know, why now in terms of um, promoting that for the American public? Well, I think as both of my panelists point out, there's a, you know, there's a, a acceleration because of the pandemic, but really we're seeing the convergence of two big trends. 
people started to care where their food came from. We went from under a thousand farmers markets in America to over 10,000 farm. People cared about organics. Whole foods became part of our lexicon and takes our, you know, part of our paychecks now. And we joke about it. <laughs> right? there, there's this aware and we all you know, know about flax. And so what used to be kind of health food became, uh, because of a lot of different media trends, uh, you know, there's a big push. And I think largely, you know, at first around heart health, this other trend takes place that's over exploded over the last 10 years, but really over the last five, like we can talk about our mental health. In fact, if you didn't have a mental health problem during the acute pandemic, there's probably something wrong with you. If you're like, nah, I'm fine, I'm good, you know, <laughs> whatever, I'm good, viral panic. People survive these forever. Right? People are like, whoa, right? It's like everybody had to, you know, it was like we were all, talk it was great as a psychiatrist. For the first time, it was like, Everybody wanted to talk about being depressed and anxious. You didn't have to be like, hey, it's, this is a safe place we can talk. So, <laughs> so suddenly we can talk about mental health and that helps us then think, what can we do for our mental health? And again, that push of nutritional psychiatry that, that you know, Joe and, and all of our colleagues just been pushing for, right? Of, hey, this is something that we can do. When you think that, you know, my, in maternal mental health, right? One of the big recommendation, this idea, eat more seafood. It, it's literally counterintuitive to what most nutritional advice and ideation is happening for women during pregnancy and, and that kind of peri-pregnancy period, even with all the data. So, you know, I, I would say that suddenly now the notion of empowerment, of decentralizing the knowledge, right? Mental health doesn't come from me, right? Mental health comes from your ability to use the internet well, and, and my colleague is much better than I am, Dr. Google, and to work collaborative with me and, and, and to be open and honest about your mental health. And so that, that's why I think people care about seafood now more than ever. It's also what other protein sources left. Like chicken's boring, you can't eat beef anymore. At least you can't say it publicly. If you do, even if I'm here in Wyoming, it's like a political statement. So seafood is left. And then I'd say from an environmental impact statement, seafood makes sense. You know, it's just, you look at sockeye salmon and it's like, I like putting my food dollars there. I feel like I'm working or at least doing my little bit with my food dollars to preserve a system that works and needs help to keep working. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. Um, recently, the USDA Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee for 2020, as well as the FDA this year, recognizes the um, benefits for brain development for babies uh, when uh, moms eat seafood. Um, Dr. Brennan, how, how did that come about? Like, you know, what, what evidence um, did the U.S., the federal agencies look at to include these recommendations? Well, in, in a manner, it, it, a starting point could have been 2015 when we, we considered carefully the, for the first time, actually, the, the implications of diet uh, for uh, depression and age-related cognitive uh, decline, that was um, a sort of a starting point, and uh, there actually was a fair amount of controversy about how strong that really was. Some of us thought it was very strong. It ended up being sort of a rank, ranked in a moderate level, but, um, but, we've, but I think that that's a reasonable starting point, and, and it, it highlighted also the, the, the composition of the brain that you, you saw in uh, Dr. Hiblin's um, presentation, and it was alluded to in the, Dr. Ramsey's presentation, that um, the, the, the brain is an omega-3 organ, and, uh, and that uh, combined with the, with the known biochemistry and genetics uh, really puts it together and, and, and shows that, that uh, nutritional support of the brain um, is really very important. Um, one, of, one of our sayings we like to, we like to uh, use is that as calcium is to the bones, uh, omega-3 is to the brain. And it's very much, uh, a, it's a good way to think about it. Thank you. I'm going to take some questions from the hop-in chat. Uh, Deanna Seagrave Daly, uh, registered dietitian, uh, is asking, any studies looking at omega-3s helping with postpartum depression? Who would like to take that? So in, oh, Dr. Hibbler? in, uh, in uh, I was talking to this uh, to one of your staff members today and just rebooted uh, the ecological study 
uh, published in 2003, looking at prevalence of postpartum depression across by seafood countries. And in countries where women don't eat seafood, postpartum depression was 50 times higher in risk than in countries where people eat seafood. Uh, and presumably because mothers deplete themselves of all of their critical brain nutrients for the sake of the baby's developing brain, women give over of themselves physically and literally such that their brains become depleted. So since then there have been, I don't think there's been a meta-analysis done of uh, randomized trials in postpartum depression, but the effect sizes are generally uh, in concordance with those for major depression. And that is that restoring adequate nutrition to the brain is at least as good as pharmacology and usually much better without side effects. I'm sorry, there are side effects. You may find your hair grows faster and thicker, you know, and there's fewer wrinkles, you know, and, and stronger nails. Uh, but, you know, if you can tolerate those side effects, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? I'm going to keep asking uh, another one from the hop-in chat. Um, oh, Dr. Martin Paul Agabaga has a question. I mean, good present from all speakers. Uh, one thing I realized is when you see a patient uh, and issues. Since the eye is more like the approachable part of the brain, do you see visual problems with this patient or do you sometimes recommend that they also do ophthalmological examinations where you can see what is happening to the eye and perhaps have a better understanding of what is happening in the brain? Who would like to take that? Dr. Ramsey? I can, I can come in quickly on that and also just the, the omega-3s uh, in pregnancy where there's significant data and also just to think of my shoes, the treatment options, you know, with the pregnant mother and there's a lot of data that antidepressant medications are quite safe in pregnancy and the biggest danger in pregnancy is depression, but there's a tremendous amount of data that eating more omega-3 fats and taking them, you know, it, it is very effective as Dr. Hipplin noted. Um, and is a, is a much more desirable option, um, but you don't see a lot of promotion of it within clinical treatment protocols. The idea of the first thing is not hey, you're thinking about pregnancy, you know, you've got depression in your family or you have depression, we got to load up seafood or get you on supplementation to keep your mental health well. And, and based on the evidence, that should be the stance. In terms of ophthalmological examination, in terms of clinical protocols for depression, that's not really part of, of uh, how we examine or think about the brain or neuronal health right now. Just, you know, clinicians like me were trained to do a, you know, I haven't used an ophthalmoscope in my entire career because the visual inspection of the neurons really isn't uh, that possible. And we're looking for function. You know, the psychiatrist, my scanner is sitting with you, hearing some questions, you know, absorbing what you're saying, how you're feeling, how you're describing your state. Um, and so we don't need to look in the eyeball so much for that. I, I think in terms of assessing nutritional status and, and sort of neuronal health status, that's <laughs> something, inflammatory status, that's something that's really those biomarkers and techniques. I would guess we're going to be seeing coming online in clinical protocols within the next 18 months to three years in mental health, just because they're increasingly getting used in research, they're getting increasingly getting used in concierge medical companies. So we'll see more of that. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Chef Johnny Carino. So he hears you loud and clear to eat seafood, that it's beneficial to eat. Um, what is the role of omega-3 capsules and supplementation in treatment protocol? Um, Dr. Hiblin, you want to go first? So um, clearly, of course, food is the best option. I just also wanted to comment uh, on Martin's question okay. to say that some of the best questions in the world reveal our, humbly reveal, uh, reveal our ignorance and, and bring us forward to get more knowledge. So thank you for that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, in my clinical experience, uh, especially with people who are very severely depressed, because 
highly concentrated EPA is such an effective antidepressant. It is so simple to give them a picture of a high EPA product and say, go to the grocery store and take four capsules of these a day. And that so quickly and so potently restores their depression. And once you've lifted the depression, then they have greater capacity to learn, to appreciate, to cook, and, and, and do those other issues. So also, um, because the background intake of omega-6 fatty acids is so high in the country and the world now, you need about four grams of EPA to get to Mediterranean blood levels effectively, and it's very hard to do uh, just with diet alone. Okay. Dr. Ramsey, um, in your protocol, are you, are you recommending supplementation, or how, what is the combination you're recommending to your patients? Probably evolved over the years. I think what uh, Dr. Hivland is pointing out is really accurate, especially when you think about depressed patients or anxious patients without a lot of knowledge or experience with something like seafood. You know, I can fantasize you're going to go eat anchovies every day, but I don't eat anchovies every day, and I'm supposed to be like leading the charge on this. So, <laughs> it, you know, I think realistically, if you're doing a great job, you're eating a few seafood meals a week. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's putting you in the 1% of seafood and, and eaters. And, and, and that's really then not doing it for the general population. Um, so I think that's where we see this in treatment protocols. Um, I generally tend to recommend the liquid fish oil just because I want people to like not worry and get a lot of it. <laughs> and so, and, uh, so that leads to some fishy burps. But I definitely like fish oil as, again, something to do quickly, something that patients tolerate something that has some good evidence behind it and something that, you know, are relevant to the treatment of depression that the brain needs. Right? So you see somebody who's having mental health symptoms and they don't eat seafood, it's just, I, I don't know, it's kind of a very um, uh, rudimentary and kind of simple, easy first step. Not, not a lot of risks, if any at all, and um, some evidence of benefit. All right, I don't, uh, I'll take, oh, Dr. Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You know, in some ways, I feel like, you know, the last 10, 15 years that I've been involved in omega-3s and omega-3 research and clinical, feels like we're preaching to the choir. How do we, as people who care about omega-3s and seafood, reach more mainstream medicine, such as, you know, obstetricians, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Psychiatric Association, and other large organizations that are tens of thousands of physicians Whereas we're kind of a small subset, and we, you know, so how do we reach the bigger audiences of mainstream medicine? That was That's a great question, Dr. and anybody who wants to write the uh, American Psychiatric Association Dietary Guidelines, I'd love to do that, because they don't have any, and they should, uh, we should as a member, so just to jump in quickly and say that. And also, I wonder if, unfortunately, it's not through physicians because it's not the way our medical system works to distribute nutrition information, uh, which is really unfortunate. But, you know, I, I don't know whether our OBGYN docs or internists in clinical practice have a lot of capacity or time to talk about seafood to patients, given the big list of things they're having to do, document. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, in the people who are actually talking to patients about food, the coaches, uh, dietitians, and nutritionists, which I know you're very involved with, is how, I, you know, those are actually who are really influencing what people eat from a clinical perspective. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. Dr. Hiblin? So for psychiatry, I was at the end of the transformation from psychoanalytic and, and psychotherapy to see this new thing CBT come and the transformation of psychiatry to becoming a pharmacological uh, medicine, a uh, pharmacological field of medicine. And it's not only driven by efficacy, it's driven by insurance reimbursement. So I think that to transform the paradigm of psychiatry it's not only a conceptual paradigm to alter, it's a financial and uh, of reimbursement. And um, the drug companies wouldn't like it, but the insurance companies would like it 
if potentially to propose first we change the diet, first we ensure nutritional sufficiency, which are lower cost interventions for the insurance company, and then if that doesn't work, use the pharmacology and use other treatment, uh, treatment protocols so that um, somebody has a financial incentive to make diet viable. Mm -hmm. That's how I, what do you think about that, Mike? Huh? Uh, Dr. Brenna, would you like to? Oh, I'll just make a quick comment uh, that, uh, and I'm in the Department of Pediatrics in the medical school at, uh, at Texas. And, um, and over the years, um, I've, I've found that uh, at least that or specialty, pediatrics, is quite um, receptive because food is essential to and, and part of pediatric practice. Babies don't grow, kids don't grow if they don't eat. So pediatricians think about that. And um, it's not a really long distance between uh, calories and protein to what sort of good stuff should be, uh, should be in the diet. Um, and, and, and so that, that, that's a little bit, I think, perhaps of a model. Um, how, how we get through to OBGYNs and others, um, I, I don't think we've, kinda, we've been able to crack that nut yet, but um, there, so there's, there, there's something else out there. So Dr. Michael Lewis is the present founder for the Brain, Brain Health Institute and uh, has been a military doctor working on brain um, traumatic injuries with omega-3s. And so I just want to say we are, we'd love to have more volunteers and ambassadors to reach these various audiences. And so if you're interested in helping us with presentations uh, to these various groups, more than happy to help arrange that as well. Um, I'm just curious personally, so with these protocols, it sounds um, just fantastic in terms of what nutrition can do for our mental health. Um, and Dr. Ramsey, you mentioned the word neuroplasticity. Uh, how quickly, I mean, one, do, you know, how quickly do these protocols work with someone with a mental health crisis? And, um, and then, you know, is there a certain age range where you know, it works better than others. Um, so I think I, I'll start with you, Dr. Ramsey. I think people can have a number, there are a number of different brain food effects that help people feel better in their mood. And so neuroplasticity is the growth of new brain cells, growth of new brain cell connections. And, uh, you know, it, as soon as you start making more BDNF and decreasing inflammation, which begins to happen reasonably quickly, you begin to make some headway with, with how you feel. I also think the empowerment part. Early on, you know, if you're depressed and I say, hey, you know what, later tonight I'm going to shut down the office. I've got a Mediterranean-style cooking class. We're going to taste some olive oil and, uh, you know, make a delicious fish meal, eat it together, share a little bit. I'm going to feel so much better 90 minutes after that cooking class. Right? So that's the way that food, you know, I think we all know. When you're down in the dumps or struggling with depression, you go to dinner with a friend and you're in that seat, you can enjoy it enough. It, it really helps lift things. So I think there are lots of ways that brain food works. This, as you saw in the, some of the data, some of the food interventions were showing an effect at three weeks. You know, that's when we think antidepressants kind of work. And in my clinical experience, after three weeks of anti-inflammatory and pro-brain health effects, you kind of get that. And then I just want to amend my comment. I think I've sounded too negative. The way that we keep spreading this through medicine, whoever asked that question, is you keep doing what we're doing. I've gotten to present to thousands of psychiatrists at the APA, the American Psychiatric Association, just because they don't have dietary guidelines. They've been really supportive of this. Mm -hmm. uh, we've gotten to train lots of clinicians. I think OBGYNs are great targets. Women mental health centers are great ways to disseminate this information. So I'm sorry if I sound a little negative about that. I think there's been incredible, incredible progress and it's a really excited time to be pushing this. We should be pushing harder than ever because people are more interested and more receptive than ever. So I'm sorry if I sounded kind of oh. Debbie Downer about that. You're good. We're going to have seafood meals at lunch, so we're all going to get a little brain boost. So <laughs> thank you. Dr. Hibbling, did you have a, did you want to say um, about the, I guess, how quickly these protocols can take for patients in your practice? So. Uh, giving, at least through capsules, high dose of high doses of EPA. Again, about four grams a day is a really great dose. I've seen people respond, start to respond in three days, 
to a week, and almost everyone really notices a, a huge change by within a month. Uh, I've primarily, I haven't had the luxury of really developing good dietary intervention skills uh, for, for my patients and, and my practice, uh, so I can't really comment on a full diet intervention, but for nutritional restoration, um, especially uh, restoring vitamin B12 to vegetarians who are, are depleted, and omega-3s a week oh, to wow. a month. Okay, Not, that's pretty quick. Now, we keep saying, we keep saying, Dr. Brenna keeps telling me it's calcium to the bones, DHA to the brain. How much of our brain is DHA and omega-3s? Well, um, the, the structural stuff, the membranes, uh, are something like, well, let's see, okay, so, so the, the breakdown, as you say, it's about it, dry weight, the brain's about 60% fat or phospholipid um, membrane, membrane kind of fat. And of that, something on the order of, uh, depending on how old you are, 10 uh, percent or uh, more is DHA. DHA is the, uh, is the main omega-3 in the brain, um, and it's at much higher concentration in the retina. It's in, it's, it's in, higher con it's in the highest concentration um, in the cells that, uh, that use a lot of energy or the parts of cells that use a lot of energy. Um, and um, um, as it turns out, EPA is quite low in the brain, but um, it goes roaring in and then does something, anti-inflammatory or other kinds of things. We're still working on what exactly it does. You heard all about the, uh, the clinical data on depression and in EPA uh, being uh, most effective against depression. Uh, and, uh, and so that's a clinical outcome, and that, and that tells you, and I, 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 I like to tell people EPA for, EPA for mood and DHA for IQ. Again, so I'm a simple guy. I'm not a... You know, I'm not a psychiatrist. So uh, uh, there's, there's easy ways to think about it. Thank you, Dr. Brenna. We have uh, time for one or two more questions. I have one from um, our chat, Georgie Heverly. Dr. Ramsey, in using diet interventions to treat mental health issues, in addition to encouraging more seafood consumption, um, do you emphasize more home cooking of seafood and, and how to prepare it, as well as how to find sustainable seafood? Yeah, it, it's a great question. I think both of those things are, are part of a good nutrition intervention where, we, you know, we're going beyond what we've often done in medicine is, you know, we tell you to eat it and we think like that, we're done. That's good. We told you, you know, like go eat the seafood. It makes you healthy, healthy, happy. And so we, home cooking is really encouraged with better mental health and I'm very biased. I've got a young family and I know I do my best. I think like how I keep track of my mental health is how many dinners a week I have with my wife and kids. And so I think it's a huge part. Also it's near and dear to my heart is I didn't know how to cook any of this stuff. I'm an Indiana farm boy. And so I love like, tell, yeah, it's like, it's weird. You give like psychotherapy with me and you, and you leave with like a gnocchi con sardi recipe. And I'm like, text me, text me when you cook it. So I, I like encouraging people uh, doing these things at home, and, and, but also having other interventions. A lot of people have helped eat seafood for the first time. You know, I say, hey, take a nibble of a friend. Uh, what do you think about sushi? And they're like, well, that looks interesting. As a, you know, and so that's where they start. Or they go to oyster happy hour, where they just buy one because they've never had an oyster before, but they want to try. So I think there are all those, uh, uh, and the sustainability is for sure. I, I'm uh, like Dr. Brenna, I'm a pretty actually simple guy for a psychiatrist. And I'm kind of like, hey, start with 10 fishes. I, like I said, I'm a diet book author. I'm like, try my wild salmon burger recipe and send me a picture of it. You know, it's, <laughs> so I, uh, I, I tend to get really functional of things, especially people who don't eat seafood, of ways you can cook it at home and then simple those first baby steps when you're a seafood newbie. Well, thank you. Um, Thank you all so much. That, that's all the time we have for our panel today. Let's give a round of applause to our panelists today, Dr. Brenna, Dr. Hiblin, and Dr. Ramsey, all the way from Wyoming. Thank you so much for joining us today.